In recent years, uh, many Christians have had an increasing sense of uncertainty and confusion about the issue of homosexuality. Uh, a key point of contention is the meaning and the authority of what the Bible teaches. But what stance should Christians and their churches take? Uh, well, Dr. Robert Gagnon, Associate Professor of the New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and author of the Bible and, homosexuality, uh, and Homosexual Practice, as well as Homosexuality and the Bible, uh, two views, uh, is with us tonight and we'll be discussing uh, this very topic with us. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Professor Gagnon. Thanks for having me. And we also have with us uh, Reagan King, uh, who will be continuing the conversation or uh, taking on the interview from, from this point. Uh, Reagan King is the church planter and pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Angel, uh, Islington, London. And he's also the company secretary of Keep Marriage Special. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, Reagan. Pleasure to be here, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, what we'll do tonight, um, I will open up in prayer and then I will hand over to Reagan for him to continue uh, with the rest of the interview this evening. Let's come before the Lord and pray. Most gracious Lord and Father, we give you thanks uh, for your word, uh, which is uh, infallible and inerrant. We give you thank you, Lord, for uh, the uh, witness of your word as well as uh, the power of your Holy Spirit uh, throughout the ages. We pray, O oh Lord, that you may be with us this evening as we open your word and discuss this very topic, O oh Lord, of homosexuality. We pray that you may be in our midst and for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hmm. Over to you, Reagan. Thank you, Kevin. And um, th thank you, Professor Gagnon, for joining us this evening. I hope that this will be a beneficial time to all who are tuning in. If I could take a very rapid-fire approach to our time this evening, I ho hope to cover a good bit of ground. Uh, I have a few questions to start us off. First of all, I hear occasionally through messages or through um, conversations statement that is something like this. Sin is sin and homosexuality is the same as any other sin. How would you respond to that question or to that statement? There's certainly features about, well first I guess I would change the word homosexuality to uh, homosexual practice uh, because homosexuality could include same-sex attractions and the mere experience of attractions of this sort does not constitute guilt or sin. Um, one has to comply with the desires in question. Um, that doesn't mean that the desire isn't sinful. Uh, it's sinful in the sense that it's a desire to do something that God doesn't want us to do. And that, by definition, uh, is a sinful desire, which is why we abstain from it. But we're not held culpable for that desire unless we acquiesce to it either in our thought life and or in our behavior. Certainly homosexual practice uh, is a sin, uh, like every other sin, in the sense that all sin disqualifies us from the kingdom of God if personal merit is the means by which we enter. So we all have to come in by God's grace. Um, we can't merit anything on the basis of our performance of what we do. However, that does not mean that sin is equal in all respects. Uh, sin, uh, it, I like the example, say for example, of a good health care program. A good health care program uh, may cover all injuries completely, uh, but it doesn't mean that all injuries are equal. So some sins are more severe by their very nature. Few people would argue that uh, a polygamous relationship is no more severe than a remarriage after divorce. We would see polygamy as worse than that. A uh, few people would want to argue that sleeping with your mother or father uh, is no more severe than any other sin. I mean, no, we would regard that as a particularly severe offense. The, the closer you get to the foundation of sexual ethics in terms of violation, the more severe the offense. And in the case of homosexual practice, we're right at the foundation. 
uh, because the foundation of creation is male and female. He made them. And, of course, Genesis 1.27. In Genesis 2.24, as Jesus said, uh, citing from there, in Mark 10 and Matthew 19, for this reason a man may become joined to a woman and the two become one flesh. So Jesus regarded this as the very foundation of all sexual ethics, that God deliberately designed us as a sexual, complementary sexual pair. He extrapolated from that foundation the view that you could limit the number of persons in a sexual union to two. Uh, that means that um, polyamory, non-traditional forms of polygamy, or polygamy itself, uh, and a revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause, while bad, are not as bad as the foundation upon which a duality of number is predicated. That is the male-female complementarity. That is the duality of the sexes. It's the two-ness of the sexes that becomes the basis for limiting the number of partners to two. So that makes the vi direct violation of that in homosexual practice a particularly severe consensual sexual offense between humans. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you touched on this briefly at the beginning of your answer there. Among many professing evangelicals, there is a mindset that says homosexual orientation, um, orientation being defined as a, an ongoing um, thought process and an ongoing um, attraction. Some would quibble over whether it's entertained or not, but th there's the mindset that says it's not a sin problem under any circumstance, only homosexual practice. Is same-sex attraction, same-sex sexual attraction, sinful? Uh, sinful in the sense that um, it is a desire to do something God doesn't want us to do, and it does not reflect the reality of the way that God made us as male and female. So Paul does refer to uh, the desire itself in Romans 1, 24 to 27 as being self-dishonoring because it treats one's maleness of male or femaleness of female as only half intact, not in relation to uh, the other sex, which is the reality. Each sex is only half the whole sexual spectrum, but only half in relation to one's own sex as though two half males make a whole male or two half females make a whole female. So that's self-dishonoring. It's dishonoring of oneself, it's dishonoring of the person that you're having sexual intercourse with. One or the other or both are functioning as only half their own sex, needing to be complemented, completed in some way, through sexual union with a person of that same sex. And that's a misunderstanding of reality. And as such, it is a desire uh, for those who experience it that needs to be challenged by having the mind renewed with the reality of the way God actually has made us, which is that we are whole in our sex as male or female. What we lack is not something in our own sex, but something that uh, if we're to engage sexually with another, that is in a person of the other sex. So in that sense, it's a sinful desire, it's a self-dishonoring desire, Therefore, we do not obey it. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're not held culpable for the mere experience of the desire unless we actively entertain it in our thought life and or in behavior. Uh, and, and a parallel, of course, would be, well, let's, let's take an uh, immediate culprit here, uh, males in general, right? Um, if a man sees a drop-dead gorgeous woman on a beach who's scantily clad, and immediately feel sexually attracted to that woman, is that a sinful desire? Well, it is a sinful desire from the standpoint, if one is married to somebody else, uh, that one is uh, being drawn in a sort of covetous way to a person that one cannot have sexually. So therefore, because we recognize it as a sinful desire, we abstain from actively engaging it in our thought life or behavior. Uh, if we didn't rec recognize it as a sinful desire, we would entertain it in our thought life and not have any remorse for doing so or comply with it in terms of our behavior. But the mere experience of that impulse is not something for which God holds us accountable. Very helpful. Thank you. Now, on the matter of identity, can someone be a Christian – 
and identify as gay so long as they are celibate? Yes and no. Uh, they could identify as gay, but it's not a good thing to do. Uh, it won't be the end of the world, I think. Uh, you can still be a Christian, but I personally don't recommend it. I would just call it unwise to do so, uh, because to identify as gay, uh, it does several things which I think are problematic. Number one, it's confusing. It obfuscates um, terminology, because usually by gay, somebody means not only a person who is self-affirming, not only a person who experiences same-sex attractions, but a person who is self-affirming of those attractions. So if you identify as a gay Christian, uh, or just simply gay, most people will understand that to mean that you not only experience those same-sex attractions, but you think that that's perfectly acceptable um, to live in accordance with them. Uh, secondly, another problem with it is in terms of a false identification for Christians, it identifies as a significant feature of one's identity as a Christian the fact that you have same-sex attractions. Now, most men, I've mentioned men before, I'll mention them again since all of us here are currently talking belong to that group, um, are just basically wired to be polyamorous. We don't ask to be, we simply are. Uh, there's ten times the main sex hormone, testosterone, in men than there is in women. Uh, men are much more visually stimulated, they're more genitally focused, uh, and they experience that desire more intensely on a regular basis than do women. Okay, But the fact that that is the case doesn't mean I identify myself as, hey, I'm a polyamorous Christian. And Paul doesn't address fellow believers in his churches uh, as uh, sinners. He identifies them as saints, as the holy ones of God, who have been reserved for God's exclusive use. He wants them to get acclimated to that new creation identity that they are in Jesus Christ, not the old person that they used to be. That old humanity is being put to debt. In fact, in some, to some degree, has already passed away because we now have the spirit of Jesus Christ inhabiting us, giving us a new identity. If Paul says in Galatians 2, 19 to 20, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Why am I identifying myself by who I was in my old humanity? Entirely inappropriate. And a third problem with the identification is, um, I don't know how else to put this, but it infantilizes the individual morally uh, because it reifies this identity that I am, this is who I am and this is who I will always be, come whatever may, come whatever circumstances, come whatever God does in my life. And um, that soon becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think for those three reasons, it's pretty wise to avoid the use of the term gay uh, unless uh, one is living a self-affirming homosexual life. And just from what we've already talked about so far, it would not be possible to live a self-affirming homosexual lifestyle and be a Christian at the same time. So. Uh well, yes and no. Um, you could, uh, just as the incestuous man at Corinth may have been a Christian uh, and then was engaged, of, engaged in egregious, immoral sexual conduct and now is at high risk of not inheriting the kingdom of God. So you could do it, but it's so thoroughly incompatible with the confession of Christ as Lord uh, that it would put one at risk in their relationship to God. So now there are two ways of looking at that. When I look at 1 Corinthians 5-6, to which focuses on the question of sexual immorality in general, and in particular on the case of the incestuous man at Corinth. When I look at that, Paul refers to this man who is sleeping with his stepmother as a person who calls himself a brother. Now that's a very unusual way for Paul to refer to a fellow believer and it indicates some degree of reservation on his part as to whether or not this is a genuine believer. He can hardly believe that a genuine believer would be sleeping with his mother or affine substitute his stepmother. On the other hand, uh, while that raises the question as to whether he ever was a genuine believer, Paul then uh, in the second half of chapter 6 gives an analogy about a man who is joined by one spirit to Jesus Christ and then goes and has engages in porneia, sexual immorality with a prostitute. 
and in effect he's he's saying you know you think that that morally improves the situation because you're joined to Jesus on the contrary if you're joined to Jesus and then you try to join yourself in an immoral one flesh sexual union with a prostitute well let's just say that's not a good look that would be the moral equivalent of walking into the Holy of Holies and and doing your sexually immoral act uh, not just outside the temple precincts not just within the temple court but in the actual Holy of Holy and then more or less daring God to do something about it so he says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that's in you uh, you do not belong to yourself anymore you were bought with nothing less than the precious blood of Jesus Christ don't do it and the warning that he gives in 1 Corinthians 6 9 to 10 is a warning to believers stop deceiving yourselves what would be deceiving yourself? Deceiving yourself would be thinking that you can engage in such egregious and moral sexual conduct and get away with it. You will not, Paul says. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have this kind of warning all throughout Paul's vice or offender list in his letters. For example, in Galatians 5, he says that I warned you before, I'm warning you again, that if you engage in any of the following behaviors in a serial, unrepentant way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, period stop deceiving yourself so that this is a consistent rhetoric on Paul's part so can a person be a Christian and engage in homosexual practice well I guess technically you could be but it's so incompatible with Christian faith that the only solution to that in Paul's opinion would be to put the person immediately on church discipline uh, in the hopes that their spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord as a remedial measure uh, that is the discipline as a remedial measure not a punitive one Understood. Um, I suppose that definitely relates to the idea of uh, purging the evil one from among you, I believe it. Mm -hmm. Those are the words of Paul. And the desire certainly would be for reconciliation and for that person to come to repentance, albeit if they were to continue in that sin as um, a form of, of lifestyle and uh, an ongoing um, sin habit that would indicate that they do not know the Lord uh, themselves, presumably. Um, let me just move on from that question and ask someone who is homosexual, can they really change? Uh, I've encountered from many people the attitude or response that someone who is homosexual could never really cease to have homosexual attractions. Now, I first um, I introduced myself a couple of years ago to you at the Setting Love in Order conference um, at Emmanuel Center in London, and that conference featured some speakers who used to be homosexuals. So, what would you say to someone who says? A homosexual can never change. They can only hope for celibacy. Well, one response would be first to talk about what changes here. Um, I understand in the way that you worded the question, your understanding change is sexual orientation change. Uh, but I just want to uh, broaden that definition of change a little bit beyond that. I think the greatest change that occurs, and it's important to change our mindset on this issue, uh, the greatest change that occurs is not so much when the individual lose, loses all desires to violate the commands of God, but when in spite of persistent desires to violate them, one remains obedient to God out of this awe and overwhelming gratitude for the grace of God that's been poured into one's life. That is the greatest amount of transformation. I mean, it's, it, the question is sort of goes this way, and it's kind of a to frame the question generally: which is the greater miracle uh, when God um, takes an impediment away from our life, a difficulty, a form of deprivation in our life, or when, like Paul talks about, with the thorn in the flesh? God doesn't remove the impediment, the difficulty, the deprivation, but rather says, no, my grace is enough for you. 
It's sufficient for you. My power will be brought to completion in the midst of your weakness. I'm not going to remove it. Well, I actually think that the greatest occasion of power, the greatest demonstration of a miracle, uh, is when Paul continues in his life to take the gospel under extraordinary circumstances, poorly sheltered, poorly fed, poorly clothed, in constant anxiety for his churches, um, beaten in the synagogues, 40 lashes minus one, beaten by rods by secular authorities, stoned, and we're not talking about drugs here, shipwrecked, all sorts of difficulties that Paul goes through. I think the greatest miracle is that Paul gets up in the morning and shares the same undiluted gospel that day that he shared the day before in spite of those continuing hardships. Again, the question more generally, which is the greater miracle, the resurrection or Jesus' going to the cross? I guess that somewhat determines your answer to this particular question. Now, having said that, do I believe that there is such a thing as sexual orientation change? Of course. Who cannot believe that? Um, even the Kinsey Institute <laughs> uh, has argued in the past in the United States that most persons who experience same-sex attractions will experience at least one and likely two shifts on the Kinsey spectrum, uh, the Kinsey scale of zero to six at some point in the course of their life, even apart from any therapeutic intervention. So, yeah, of course, people do move all the time. I'm not saying they move radically from six totally homosexual to zero totally heterosexual like that on a whim, um, but some degree of limited change is actually the norm. Um, radical change, probably not the norm. It's pretty rare, even in Christian circles. Um, but it does happen. Uh, many of the persons that you would have met in the, that conference in Emmanuel Christian Center would talk about the change that they've experienced in their life, but they would also talk about, on occasion, still residual persistence of same-sex attractions at different points. That's okay. I didn't discover when I became a Christian uh, that I lost all attractions for women who were not my wife. It just hasn't happened. Here I am, 56 years old, still waiting for that day to happen. Hasn't happened yet. Does that mean that I call into question God's power? Does that mean I call into question God's commands about monogamy? Not at all. Uh, I understand God's power to work in the midst of my weakness. Thank you very much for that, um, Professor Gagnon. Um, if we sometimes say when we're faced culturally with a shift where people as has happened here in the United Kingdom um, and has has happened just in the past few weeks in the United States people are pushing for a redefinition of marriage or gay marriage and a Christian says well just remember they're not married in the Lord's eyes just the lands so let's just evangelize and spread the good news is that's more of an important issue. W would you say that Christians should be civil homosexual unions or should they just be bothered if it comes into churches? Say that first part of it again. Should we be bothered about what now? Should we be bothered by civil homosexual unions, homosexual unions that are endorsed and accepted by the state, um, although they may or may not be practiced in churches. Right. Is that supposed to be bothered? Well, I would, I, if, if somebody said that they wouldn't be bothered by such civil unions, I would ask them whether they would, whether they would be bothered uh, by a civil union endorsing an arrangement between a man and his mother, or between uh, a man and three women or between in a jointly heterosexual and homosexual relationship, two women and two men. Uh, and I would think most Christians would be bothered by that uh, because the, you know, they're not only immoral unions when Christians engage in them, they're immoral unions when anybody engages in them. And why would we want even civil government endorsing a union that is inherently immoral? So Christians should, of course, be bothered by that Christians are to be a light to the world, which doesn't mean to say, well, we don't care if the, the whole world promotes sinful, harmful conduct. We do care. 
Um, you know, we would care if there's racism in society. We'd want to end that as Christians. We wouldn't want to say we only end racism in the church. We would want to end it in society as a whole. And we would certainly not want to promote sexual immorality outside the church. Christians live 95 to 98% of their life outside the church walls. And, uh, and they get indoctrinated in the school systems. They can get persecuted in the larger culture. Immorality can be promoted to them ad nauseum by the media. Uh, we are affected by, by what happens in the larger culture. And the larger culture um, is going to make life difficult for everyone in promoting something that's immoral. So, of course, we should be concerned about it. We should try to do what we can uh, to prevent societal support of it. And when societal society does support it, the civil government supports it, uh, we should do what we can to resist it. In your opinion, what is the biggest problem present in professing evangelicalism today in its thinking through the homosexual issue? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, there are so many problems, it's hard to know which one to to pinpoint or identify is the is the biggest one. Uh, I'm not saying the biggest one. Let me just throw one out there as one of them. Uh, a big misunderstanding. Well, there's a number of misunderstandings by Christians. One is the severity of the issue of, uh, of homosexual practice, and there's a general view prevailing within evangelical circles that in order to love somebody who is engaged in this form of immorality, you have to reduce the severity of the offense. So that there's an inverse relationship, there's a proportional relationship there. If, if the, the greater, uh, the, if I'm going to love somebody more, uh, inverse related here, inverse relationship, if I'm going to love somebody more, I have to reduce uh, the severity of the offense so it doesn't, it's not so bad, so therefore I can love. Uh, Jesus did not operate in that way. Jesus reached out to the most egregious violators of God's demand in his society, economically tax collectors, who had a justly deserved reputation for collecting many times more than they were supposed to collect, exploiting fellow Jews uh, on behalf of an oppressive foreign power and pocketing the excess for themselves. Uh, liberation theologians would have a field day with them. And the worst forms of sexual sinners uh, in his cultural context. People weren't committing homosexual practice who were Jews because that was just so verboten. There's no way that uh, anyone would make that known if they were even doing it, uh, let alone advocate for it. So Jesus aggressively reached out in love to the biggest violators, not reducing the severity of the offenses. He kept up his uh, opposition to material exploitation of the poor very much within the prophetic stream and even ratcheting it up some further, the demand, and uh, with regard to sexual sin, actually tightening God's demand on sexual ethics, making it more intense. So uh, we don't find a Jesus who is softening these demands, but rather intensifying them, even as he reaches out to the biggest violators. I think that's a big problem with the church. We should not have to lie and say that homosexual practice is not a particularly severe sexual offense. It is. It violates the very foundation of creation ethics, of sexual ethics ensconced in creation. At the same time, it's precisely for that reason that we should all the more aggressively reach out in love to those who do violate that demand, because they're at great need of being restored to the kingdom of God. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor. I'm going to hand back to Kevin. I hope um, for all of you who have been tuning in that this has been a useful um, discussion and that you will continue to think over these things. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Reagan. And uh, I would like to give thanks to both of you for joining us this evening. I have found uh, the conversation very helpful. Uh, thank you also to all of our viewers that have uh, joined us this evening. For more information on any of our past or future Google Hangouts, please visit our Grace Baptist Partnership YouTube channel. And, uh, well, thank you again for joining us and every blessing to you too. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Bye.